Good morning to, to everybody. Uh, today we have two gone through uh, US and UK story uh, concerning uh, uh, regulation framework and legal framework for private equity and, and venture capital. Uh, yesterday we started from uh, United States, uh, even though we, we said that uh, US and UK are quite, quite similar because private equity is not regulated by financial services laws and second they are both countries of common law and probably last US and UK try really to have the same regulation in private equity in order to avoid competitive advantage or disadvantages between the two different countries. We started from US and uh, to highlight, to identify the vehicles investing in private equity, we don't have other solution than to give a look to the market and to verify and to check what's going on because we don't have any regulation. Uh, if, you go, give, if you give a look to the markets, in the United States it's possible to identify, you remember, five different vehicles even though the first two vehicles cover more or less the market of private equity. So if we want to say what are the vehicles in the United States, okay, it's absolutely right to say the vehicles are five and we have to discuss about it, even though in terms of volume, in terms of size of the market, the vehicle number one and the vehicle number two cover more or less the majority of the investment, where the majority means between the 85 and 90 percent of the U.S. market. So if you understand everything about the first two vehicles, you understand everything about the United States. Just to come back to the list of players, the player number one, which is the most important player, is the venture capital fund or simply fund. And yesterday we said, okay, venture capital fund is a limited partnership and we try to analyze and to understand the mechanism of functioning of a limited partnership investing in private equity. Uh, the other thing which is important, please remember it, the mechanism of limited partnership is quite, quite similar to the mechanism of an asset management company and the close and fund in Europe because we have the distinction between managers and investors. We have the rule of commitment, 1% in US, 2% in Europe. Uh, we have the problem of fundraising like in uh, Europe. Uh, we have uh, a maturity of 10 years which is driven by law, by a fiscal, fiscal law in the United States, which is driven by the market in Europe. Because if you remember, I said many times, also in Europe, the average maturity of a closing fund is 10 years. Okay? In the United States, it's not an average maturity. It's just simply a maturity which is driven by the law. Okay? Sorry, by taxation laws. Also in the US, sorry if I didn't mention it yesterday, but it's fundamental. Also in the US, it's possible to use the so-called extra time. You remember in closing fund it's possible to use an extra time, which is maximum of three years. In the United States, the extra time is obviously driven by taxation law, okay? Because it's taxation law that says the maturity of the LP is 10 years, okay? So obviously it's the taxation law that has to say something about the usage of an extra time. United States, the extra time is one year. If you have to use more, is a tragedy because the LP has to pay taxes, okay? That means the maturity is 10 years. You can use just simply one year as an extra time. It's not possible to use more because otherwise you lose tax benefit. That means everybody uses in United States an extra time of one year because it's a nonsense to lose tax benefits, okay? Last, we said that in the limited partnership we have also the same mechanism of cost and revenues. That means obviously the investors are looking for the final capital gain and the managers, which are the GP, work for you because of the management fee and because of the carried interest, okay? The way the mechanism to calculate management fee and carried interest are exactly the same 
what we uh, discuss in Europe. So I don't repeat again the two mechanisms because they are exactly the same. Also, percentage are more or less the same. Also, in the United States, the golden standard is 30% of carried interest and 8% of other rate, okay? Exactly the same standard because the business of private equity is the same in whatever country in, in the world. Last, yesterday I mentioned that take care because in the limited partnership you can use leverage and that's quite fundamental because the usage of leverage modify completely the risk and return of investment for the investors. You have more risk and you have more return because of the usage of the leverage. Because the usage of the leverage is a critical issue, uh, GP and LPs want to regulate the usage of leverage in the LPA, okay? It's fundamental. Just the last issue. The work and the life in the United States for the general partner is harder than in Europe, not only because you remember the story they are fully liable and blah, 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 okay? But also because in fundraising, if you do think about that, uh, general partners has to manage a double fundraising because general partner has to manage fundraising from limited partners but in the same time they have to manage fundraising from the banking system and the game is tremendous not only because I have to organize a dinner with you I have to try to convince okay to invest uh, you say Stefano if I'm the first I don't want to invest okay let's imagine but I have, in the same time, another story. I have to go to the banking system to say, Dear banking system, would you like to give me uh, $50 million of loans? And you say, Yes, Stephen, but I would like to know the names of the limited partners. And limited partners, uh, probably, they say, Stephen, we want to invest, but we want to know what are the names of the banks. So it's really a double story in the United States because it's a double story of fundraising. Fundraising from the LPs, from the investors, and fundraising from the financiers. So take care, because it's really a, a tremendous job. Obviously, because everything in this world more or less is rational, it's obvious that this tremendous job is made by the GPs because their expectation of carried interest is higher than in Europe because there is the leverage. And because of the leverage, the expectation of return at the end is higher, and obviously also the current interest for the GPs is higher than in Europe. Otherwise, if it is not higher, it's a nonsense for a GP to do this work in the United States. Also, GP in the United States starts use close and fund if it is not convenient for them. Okay? So take care about these different issues. Also, for your exam, but not only for your exam, please try to compare every day, in every moment, a close and fun and a limited partnership. Not only because it's a classical question, okay, in the exam, but because it's crucial, okay? Because every day when you want to invest in private equity, your problem is to say, you use a European vehicle or you use an American vehicle to invest in Europe. And you have to compare pros and cons of the two different solutions, okay? This is the classical problem in whatever part of the world, to use a European vehicle or a common law vehicle like a limited partnership. The second story and the second vehicle is the SBIC. This is not an international story. This is a domestic story, a typical US story. Okay? Uh, SBIC are special vehicles created by a special law of the United States in 1958. Okay? Uh, the aim of that law was to create something special in order that for investors uh, was possible and easy to invest in private equity. And so U.S. government decided to create a small business investment company. Okay? If you remember, that was the last issue yesterday we said uh, SBIC is a joint venture in which you have two shareholders, public and private. So it's a perfect joint venture but it's an asymmetric joint venture because the management is uh, only in the end of the private investor. So the public investor is a pure financer. Uh, it's quite important that the SBIC is characterized by two big pros. The pro number one 
the SBIC, like the LP, doesn't pay taxes. That's great. And second, the SBIC uh, can be uh, raise money from the U.S. government with a cap of 33% of debt. Uh, it's quite important to raise money from U.S. government because uh, the loans is characterized by a special interest rate which is always uh, smaller than the interest rate you have to pay in the market. So it's quite, quite interesting, this vehicle, but it's typically U.S. focused because you need to find a public partner where public partner must be uh, a, a U.S. public administration. So it's not possible for other public authorities coming from other countries to create an SBIC. Private investor, yes, you can, but public administration, only U.S. public administration. That's the reason why it's a typical, a typical U.S. vehicles. Okay, guys? Uh, please remember that these are the two vehicles relevant in U.S., okay? But because in, we stay in the classroom and it's important to understand everything, but however, in a very fair way, you have to know that these are the two vehicles, but however, it's possible also to identify other three vehicles, which are corporate ventures, banks, and business angels, okay? Take care because it's not very easy to understand these three vehicles. It's not very easy because I don't have rule. I don't have anything to tell to you because they are three different phenomena. What I would like to say, bank, corporation, private individual, in most of cases, invest their money as limited partners in venture capital funds, okay? Obviously, if you are a bank, if you are a private individual, or uh, if you are a, a, a corporation and you want to invest in private equity in the U.S., obviously, you invest as limited partners, okay? No doubt about that. But, however, there are three different phenomena. The phenomenon, number one, is corporate ventures. Corporate ventures means that sometimes corporation in the United States create a department inside a corporation, a department which is devoted to venture capital, And the aim of this division inside of the corporation is not simply profit, but the aim is to manage venture capital to generate ideas and products that are useful for the corporation. Okay? So corporate ventures means that sometimes the United States corporation create inside, inside, so it's not a legal entity, inside a division, a department, and this division or department is devoted to venture capital, where the investment in venture capital is not simply for profit, but to invest in venture capital is for creating ideas and products which are relevant for the corporation. Okay? Uh, it's very hard to have data of this phenomena because these divisions are not legal entities, you understand? So it's not possible to have a statistics about the size of this activity. What we know is that if we give a look to the major corporation in the United States, it's quite common to identify a department of division devoted to venture capital. I don't know if you jump into, okay, just to mention big names, if you jump into Microsoft organization, you find a very strong department devoted to venture capital, okay? What is the purpose? What is the aim of this department? The aim is not profit, because Microsoft invests a lot in private equity as a limited partners in venture capital fund, obviously. When Microsoft would like to invest money in private equity, 
invest as limited partners in many venture capital funds. But Microsoft also would like to have its personal department division to run venture capital because the aim is not immediately profit, but is to develop ideas, products that can be relevant for the Microsoft as a corporation. Okay? So it's not immediately profit, but is to generate ideas and products that can be generate profit for the corporation. This is the phenomena of corporate ventures. So we don't have any specific rules, we don't have any specific legal entities, it's an internal phenomena inside a corporation. Okay? Uh, very often, corporations really uh, love to name this department also incubator. Okay? That means it's a department, it's a division devoted to incubate ideas and products. Okay? Is it okay, guys? Very simple, but important. What is difficult is to have a statistics about it and this phenomena. Some authors say uh, this phenomena represented 10% of private equity in the U.S. Others try to estimate that the phenomena is bigger and corporate ventures represent more than the 20%. So it's very difficult because we don't have official statistics. We don't have official statistics about the phenomena of corporate ventures. Okay? Player number four, just to mention, like in Europe, we have also bank. Like in Europe, it's very hard that a bank invest in private equity because of the same reasons I mentioned for Europe. And the reasons are regulatory framework concerning regulatory capital. So it's quite stupid for a bank to invest in equity because of the high expenditure of regulatory capital and because of the fact your performance is a net performance and it's not a gross performance. Like in Europe, I have to say, okay, a bank can invest, but it's quite uncommon. Like in Europe, where a bank invests in closing funds, also United States, typically bank invests in venture capital funds, exactly like in Europe. Okay? Or like in Europe, banks are the owner of a venture capital fund. That means a bank can be the general partner of a venture capital fund, like in Europe, where some asset management companies are owned by banks, exactly like in Europe. Okay? Is it okay? I would like to check because in my opinion it's very simple, but coming from my experience, I know that this generates some problem or misunderstanding uh, from the students. So is it okay? Guys, yes or not? Okay. Last, like corporate ventures, which is a sort of informal phenomena, which is very difficult to be uh, classified and measured, in the United States we have also another quite important phenomena, but it's quite impossible to have statistics about that. And the phenomenon is the phenomenon of business angels. Uh, who are business angels? Business angels are private individuals or no profit organization that invest in venture capital. Business angels are private individuals or no profit organization which invest in venture capital. That means seed, startup, and early. Huh? Okay? Like corporate ventures. In this case, in your opinion, what is the driver? For what reason Mr. Stefano Caselli, a private individual, would like to invest as a private individual in seed or startup, which is more or less like to go to the casino. Okay? Um, for what reason a no-profit organization, that means a charity, 
would like to invest in seed or startup. For what reason? It's easier both for me and for a charity to invest like limited partners in a venture capital fund. It's simpler, okay? I have no trouble, I give money to you for 10 years, it's okay. If I act as a business angel, I have a lot of trouble because I have to negotiate with a company. I have to invest and I have to lose the whole amount of money. For what reason? What is the driver, in your opinion, of the two cases which are different? The private individuals and the foundation or the non-profit organization. What are the drivers, in your opinion? Private individuals, first of all, and non-profit organizations, second. Private individuals. For what reason? In your opinion, what are the drivers? There are two main drivers. We can identify also other drivers, but we have generally two main drivers. The driver number one, please remember, because it's classical, when United States would like to incentivize something, they use tax benefit. A private individual that invests in a company and will have a capital gain if the private individual invests again the capital gain in another company, the private individual doesn't pay taxes. So if Mr. Stefano Caselli invests in the company of Cindy, I'm very lucky because I invest 1 million euros and after three years I exit with three million euros, I have to pay a taxation on capital gain, okay? Which in the United States for private individual is a 39.2%. Tremendous. But if I take the two million of capital gains and I invest again these two million in another company, I don't pay taxes. So, is a big fiscal incentive. And this is the first reason why a private individual invests in venture capital, because U.S. government gives tremendous tax benefit. The two conditions are, first of all, you must be U.S. citizen. Sorry, three conditions. Condition number one, you must be U.S. citizen. Second, uh, you must invest as a venture capitalist. That means you have to invest in seed, startup, and early. And last, you have to invest in companies which are not listed in the stock exchange. So, three different conditions. You have citizens, venture capital, and company which are not listed in the stock exchange. It's a tremendous incentive. What is the, the reason of this incentive is obvious, to try to sustain, to support people that would like to invest directly in U.S. companies. That's great, okay? It's a way to try to incentivate direct investment. This is the first reason. The second reason why the phenomenon of business angel uh, is powerful and relevant is that a lot of venture capital funds and a lot of SBIC offer services to people that would like to act as a business angel. That means if Stefano Caselli would like to invest 1 million euro in the company of Cindy, it's okay, tax benefit, I'm happy. But it's a tremendous job for me, you understand, because I have to write contracts to understand if I have to sit in the board of directors of Cindy, uh, it, it's quite time consuming and complex, okay? And that's the reason, for example, why in Europe we don't have business angels. Not simply because we don't have fiscal incentive, but also because it's impossible for Stefano to devote uh, the 20, the 30 percent of my time uh, to negotiate with Cindy. I don't have this time, you understand? But in the United States, Venture Capital Fund, SBIC, say, Stefano, don't worry, we offer to you a very cheap service in order that we help you to negotiate with Cindy and also we give to you services to manage administrative uh, issues concerning your investments. Why Venture Capital Fund and SBIC 
decided to do, to do and to offer this service. Because they are quite smart, because they understand that if they help Stefano today to invest one million, perhaps in the future, when Stefano will exit from the company of Cindy, what happens? Probably the company of Cindy, if you are lucky, in five years, will become bigger. And the company of Cindy can be a target for the venture capital fund or the SBIC. And it's obvious that if Stefano is quite satisfied of the service of the venture capital fund, after five years, I will give a call to the venture capital fund to say, dear venture capital fund, thank you very much for what you did five years ago. Now the company of Cindy is a company of 20 million dollars of sales. Do you want to invest? So it's a sort of synergies between uh, the venture capital funds and the private individuals that would like to invest like business angels. If we don't have fiscal incentive and if we don't have services coming from other players, for a private individual it's quite impossible to act as a business angel because I don't have time and I waste a lot of money because of taxation. The story of no-profit organization is different than you can imagine, it's simpler. A no-profit organization would like to act as a business angel because a no-profit organization would like to give money not only for profit but also for social purposes. And that's quite interesting because to have no-profit organization that invests like venture capital creates synergies with venture capital funds that invest in seed financing only with a pure goal of profit. Because in some cases, for a venture capital fund, it's very difficult to invest in seed because it's quite hard or impossible to identify what will be the return. And in this case, it's fundamental the role of non-profit organization that say we would like to invest. For what reason? Because profit for us is important but it's more important social purposes. So if you cannot invest the venture capital fund, I invest as a charity. Also in this case, there is a good synergy between venture capital fund and other players that would like to invest. Okay? Okay, guys. So take care. Take care especially about these two phenomena which are very simple, okay? Because we don't have a specific law but they are quite important in the United States and it's very hard also to calculate the size, okay? It's also quite difficult to calculate the size of these two phenomena because they are not official, they are not driven by law. So we don't have uh, 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 the size of these phenomena in the United States, but we have the feeling it's quite important phenomenon. Is it okay, guys? So this is the U.S. story. This is the U.S. story which is a story, if we, go on, so if we want to summarize, a story of uh, no rules and the story of very, very smart incentive coming from the U.S. government. And uh, we have a big market in the United States because American people were lucky or smart, I don't know, to find a good compromise, a good blend between no rules and very strong fiscal incentive. And when the blend is quite well done, the result is incredible. And we have the, the biggest market in the world for private equity. So this is U.S. story. Now we have to jump into U.K. story, which is quite, quite similar to U.S. story, because also in U.K. we find the same good blend of no rules and very strong fiscal incentive. Exactly the same of U.S. story. Also, in the United Kingdom, we have the same approach. We don't have rules and for this reason we have to give a look to the market to identify what are the vehicles we find in the United Kingdom. Also in the U.K., we find five vehicles uh, and we have to identify what are the five vehicles. The vehicle number one is exactly the same as the United States, is VCF, 
venture capital fund or simply fund and the venture capital fund in the United Kingdom is like in US a limited partnership and like in US is a 10 years limited partnership because of no taxation so exactly the same approach so we don't spend time to discuss about VCF because please cut and paste with United States okay also United Kingdom VCF are the leading vehicle and the more important vehicle in like United States VCF cover more or less the 70 percent of the market of United Kingdom exactly exactly the same story the vehicle number two that like in US vehicle number two means the second vehicle in terms of volume is a very special United Kingdom vehicle and we have to study it which is venture capital trust or VCT okay venture capital trust or VCT and last, like in US, we have other three vehicles, and the other three vehicles are banks, business angels, and local public private vehicles. Okay? So the five vehicles we have in the United Kingdom are VCF, Venture Capital Trust, Banks, Business Angels, and local public-private vehicles. Okay? Like in US, the most important story is the story of the first two vehicles. VCF, please give a look to the United States. What I would like to analyze is Venture Capital Trust, which is a quite new phenomena, but is quite impressive. Why is it a quite new phenomena? It's a quite new phenomena because Venture Capital Trust was created by a special law coming from Tony Blair in 1997. So it's a quite new phenomena, but it's quite impressive because in 12 years, Venture Capital Trust represent the vehicle number two in terms of volumes in the United Kingdom. And in many other countries in the world, countries of common law, obviously, uh, 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 governments would like to understand if it makes sense to introduce this kind of vehicles also in other countries. So it's a quite interesting phenomena. Just to give you an idea, in the United Kingdom, we have more or less 350 venture capital trust okay just to compare in Italy we have 80 closing funds in France 75 in Germany 90 just to compare numbers in United Kingdom 350 venture capital trust which represent the vehicle number two okay in terms of VCF in the United Kingdom, we have more than 3,000 venture capital fund, just to give you numbers in terms of vehicle. What are venture capital trust? Uh, it's really a very British vehicle. Even behind, the mechanism is always the same. People that manage, people that invest, management fee and carried interest. Behind every vehicle you find exactly the same mechanism. But in this case the organization of the Venture Capital Trust is quite strange. Because investors don't invest in a fund or in a legal entity but investors give their money to a trust and because it's a trust there is a trustee that manage the money which are in the trust uh, I have a problem now my problem is do you know 
is not related to private equity. Do you know what is a trust? Do you know what is a trust? Yes or not, Guy? Because if you don't know what is a trust, it's impossible to understand. Okay. Uh, trust is a special vehicle uh, that was born in the United Kingdom more or less 600 years ago. Okay? So it's one of the oldest uh, vehicle and legal entity creating United Kingdom. Okay? That's the reason why I said venture, cal venture capital trusts are quite British because venture capital trust uses the oldest legal entity existing in the United Kingdom. Okay? So British people really love trust because it's the oldest vehicle that was created in the United Kingdom. What is a trust? A trust is a vehicle which is created to help people to separate from their wealth. A trust is a vehicle which is created to help people to separate from their wealth. And why people have to separate from their wealth? It's a strange reason. It's a strange story. Let's imagine Stefano Caselli had buildings, money, and securities. Why I won't separate from my wealth? For what reason? For what reason, guy? I want to have my wealth. For what reason I have to separate from my wealth? Give me reasons why it's necessary or it's useful sometimes. For example, your assets are not seen in case you have some obligations. Sorry? In case you have obligations, uh, your assets are not seen. can be, but is, is not a big driver or one of the most important drivers. There are other reasons which are more important, more, more important. You can't manage them. You can't manage them. I cannot manage, yeah. You're too young or not. Let's change the perspective. Let, let, let's change the perspective. Let's change the perspective. Let's imagine I'm 90 years old, okay? Uh, I have big wealth and I have... Uh, four sons with a lot of nephews, okay? And I want to manage a right, a perfect succession. I'm not able to do that. And I say, I would like to separate from my wealth. I insert my wealth in a trust and I give a mandate to a trustee to manage the succession for me. This is the first reason. Second reason. I want to protect my wealth. Let's imagine, Stefano Caselli has a lot of money, but tomorrow morning I would like to become an entrepreneur. Okay? As an entrepreneur, probably I'm fully liable, and there is the risk that I can lose my wealth. Do you understand? What is the solution? I have a lot of wealth. I would like to separate myself from my wealth, and I insert in a trust, and I give a mandate to a trustee to manage my wealth. Third driver, tomorrow morning Stefano Caselli will become a politician, okay? Let's imagine if I have a lot of wealth and I became a prime minister or I became governor of a central bank, I stay in a conflict of interest, okay? What I can do? I separate myself from my wealth, I insert my wealth in a trust and I give a mandate to a trustee to manage my wealth. It's exactly what happened, for example, three years ago when Mario Draghi, you know Mario Draghi is the governor of Bank of Italy. Mario Draghi has an impressive personal wealth and Mario Draghi has a lot of shares in most of the banks all around the world. When Mario Draghi became governor of Bank of Italy, the first decision was I separate myself from my wealth, I insert all my wealth in a trust and I give a mandate to a trustee to manage my wealth. The trust in this case is called blind trust because Mario Draghi doesn't know anything about the management of his wealth. Okay, so different reasons why someone would like to separate himself from his personal wealth. The mechanism is I insert my wealth in a trust 
I lose in that very moment the ownership. I completely lose the ownership and I give a mandate to a trustee who is a professional, who is a banker, who is a lawyer, is a wise man uh, to whom I give a mandate and the trustee has an absolute power to manage my wealth. Obviously in the mandate it's written what are the guidelines and what are the purposes of the management of my wealth. In the case of Mario Draghi, probably in the trust contract it's written, you have to manage my wealth till to the end of my mandate in Bank of Italy. If I say I want to separate from my wealth because I'm 90 years old and I don't want to be involved in the problem of my sons and uh, daughters, in the mandate it's written, dear trustee, you have to manage and to distribute the wealth to my uh, sons and to my daughters. I don't want to be involved in it. Okay? You give a specific mandate. Okay? So the idea of Tony Blair in 1997 was to use a vehicle which is quite known, quite loved in the United Kingdom to say, okay, you can use a trust also to invest in private equity. And so a venture capital trust is a scheme in which investors are common people, retail investors, that insert their money in a trust and they give a mandate to a trustee where a trustee is a professional, a bank, a manager that manage their money to invest only in venture capital. Okay? Only in venture capital. There are also other two elements which are quite interesting. The first element is, like in the US, a very strong taxation incentive. The trust which is used to invest in venture capital doesn't pay taxes. So if Mr. Stefano Caselli gives 100 pounds to the trust to invest in venture capital, the trust doesn't pay taxes. That's great. The problem is when the common investor, when Stefano Caselli can exit from the investment, okay? The solution is quite tricky because the solution is that when the investor invests in the trust, the investor receives a certificate, a security, and the security is by law traded on the London Stock Exchange. The security the investor receives for the investment is traded on the London Stock Exchange. I know it's difficult, but please take care. It's traded, but because the vehicle is a trust, and by law, the trust has no disclosure. You invest in a vehicle, you have a security, but even you are listed in the stock exchange, the trust has no disclosure to the market. So you don't know in which companies the trust is investing, even the security are listed in the stock exchange. It's a quite tricky solution because in the same time you are able to create something which is for everybody but in the same time is quite private because to be quite private is the fundamental characteristic of private equity. If everybody knows in which companies you are investing is not private equity. But in this case because you are using a trust by law the trust has no disclosure and you are listing on the stock exchange a vehicle that has no disclosure. Uh, in the stock exchange, you simply receive information from a trustee. The trustee gives to you the balance sheets, gives to you the values of your money, but you don't know anything about the targets in which the trust is investing. Because of this incredible compromise 
of a need of to be private and a need to list on the stock exchange the securities, the venture capital trusts are a quite successful story. And that's the reason why 350 vehicles we have in the United Kingdom. Just to highlight two uh, uh, elements which are important, otherwise you forget, the trust can invest only in venture capital, and investors can be only retail investors. So professional investors cannot invest in a venture capital trust. Okay? But the idea of Tony Blair was to create a vehicle that helped retail people to invest in venture capital without acting as business angels, you understand? Because if I don't have a venture capital trust, for Stefano, the only possibility to invest in private equity is to act as a business angel, but I have no time to do that. Venture capital trust is a good mechanism to help common people to invest in venture capital with the well-known taxation incentive because you don't pay taxes. That's great. Okay, guys, take care because many countries, especially in Asia, would like to introduce venture capital trust because it's really, it's really a successful story. It's really a successful story. Okay? So take care about it. Last, the other three vehicles, banks and business angels, please see United States. Because banks, like United States and like Europe, we have to mention, because a bank can invest obviously in private equity, but like US, like in Europe, like in every part of the world, it's quite uh, stupid that a bank invests in private equity because of regulatory capital and blah, blah, blah. We know, but we have to mention. Business angels, exactly the same story of the United States. Business angels are private individuals and foundation. And like the United States, private individual has a lot of taxation incentive to invest as business angels, exactly like the United States. What is different? I would like simply that you know, okay? In order that you know everything. Also in UK, we find something which is similar to small business investment company. They are local public private vehicles. They are not so important like SBIC, uh, and they are local, that means this joint venture between public and private investors are regulated by local law. Okay, so they are local law in the United Kingdom that enhance, regulates uh, public-private vehicles which are joint ventures between public and private investors like SBIC. What is the big difference coming from the United States? The size of the volume is not relevant. And second, vehicles are quite small and quite different because they are regulated on local basis. The United States, the decision was stronger, was to say, okay, we create uh, a federal law to give in every state the same opportunity. Just simply to know that, however, also in UK, there is a story of a joint venture between public and private, even though they are local and not so important. Okay? This is the picture, okay? This is the final picture. So if we want to summarize, and we come to an end of this part, uh, the number of vehicles you can use in the world to invest in private equity is not so big, because vehicles are close and fun in Europe. Venture capital fund in United States and United Kingdom plus all the other countries. Venture capital trust is a special case in the UK. And please remember the phenomena of SBIC in United States. So in the world, the set, the number of vehicles you can use to invest in private equity is not big. There is a very small selection of vehicles you can use. And the big trade-off, the big choice is limited partnership versus close and fund. It's typically the choice you have to 
to do when you decided to invest into, into private equity. Is it okay? So now we really know everything about vehicles of private equity in the world. And for this reason, you have to jump into a new topic which is strongly related to the legal framework. And the next topic is the fiscal framework. It's strictly related to the legal framework because, okay, when you want to understand how it works, the investment of private equity is important to know the legal framework, but you have to know also the functioning of costs and revenues, and the functioning of costs and revenues is driven also by taxation. And if you consider many times when we discuss about the legal framework, I mentioned taxation. So you know something about taxation because sometimes I, I discuss about taxation. Now we have to create something which is important and relevant for you to understand taxation. Uh, to talk, to discuss about taxation, I have a big problem. And the big problem is, for taxation, obviously, we are not so lucky like for a legal framework. Because in legal framework, we were quite lucky. Europe, US and UK, that's it. We were lucky. In taxation, obviously, in every country, we have a taxation system which is different. So if we want to talk about taxation, we have to discuss about taxation in 200 countries in the world. And obviously, it's a nonsense, because we don't have time to do that. But it's also unuseful. Uh, what is my strategy to talk and to discuss with you about taxation? Uh, I decided to follow a double strategy. From one side, my purpose, my goal, is to create for you a framework, a tool, that you can use to classify the taxation phenomena for private equity. So I give you a tool, I give you a map that you can apply every time, every day. You have to understand the functioning of taxation in whatever country in the world, okay? I give you the methods you can apply. This is my first goal. The second goal is, okay, let's try to apply these methods, this tool, to some specific cases. And the cases I would like to use, in my opinion, are Italy, because we stay in Italy, and okay, it's an example of Europe, and obviously UK and US because they are the two leading countries for private equity in the world. So I do believe it's a good compromise in order that you will receive the method, the tool you can apply forever, and we try to apply this tool to three different countries. In my opinion, I think it's enough and it's good for you. But first of all, let's start from the method we have to apply to understand taxation. What is the method? I would like to give to you. Uh, the method we have to apply is a method which is based on a matrix. Uh, in this matrix, what we have to highlight? We have to highlight two different variables. The variable number one is tools of taxation. So we have to identify what are the tools that governments in the world can use to manage taxation on private equity. So on this part of the matrix we highlight what are the tools. On the other part of the matrix we highlight who are the players involved in taxation. So from one side the tools, on the other side, the players which are involved into taxation, okay? Tools, players involved into taxation. Let's start. Who are the players involved in taxation, in your opinion? Who are the players? From a logical point of view, we have 
three players involved into taxation from a logical point of view. Who are the three players involved in taxation in private equity? The three players. First of all, the first player is obvious. The vehicle we use, the first player we have to understand in terms of taxation is the vehicle. That means the closing fund, yes. The limited partnership, okay. The venture capital, so the vehicle. For, for what reason we start from the vehicle? Because when we discuss about the closing fund, we said the fund is the core to understand cost and revenues. So, first of all, we have to understand the impact of taxation on the vehicle. This is the first player we have to analyze. So, this is the first player, vehicles. The second player, investors, that mean people that give money. So if you want to understand taxation of private equity, first of all, you have to understand taxation of the vehicle, second, the taxation of investors, and last, the taxation of company demanding capital. Taxation of vehicles, taxation of investors, and taxation of company demanding capital. Why is it important to understand taxation of company demanding capital? Because taxation can drive the demand of equity capital or debt capital. If we stay in a country in which companies has a lot of incentive to raise money through debt, it's very hard that in that country there is private equity. Because for the company it's more convenient to raise money through debt. On the contrary, if we stay in a country in which all taxation incentives for the company are focused on equity, like in UK, it's obvious that all the companies uh, are looking for equity capital because they have taxation incentive. So if we want to understand what is the impact of taxation on private equity, we have to understand taxation on vehicles, taxation on investors, and taxation on company demanding capital. This is the study of the players involved in taxation. But on the other side, we have to highlight what are the tools that they can use to manage and to drive taxation on those vehicles. Okay? And from a logical point of view, we can identify five different tools government can use. Five different tools. The tool number one is Taxation on, in your opinion, what is the most important tool we have to analyze, to understand, taxation on? Capital gain. The second tool is taxation on dividends. That's great. The other three tools probably are not so obvious for you. For this reason, I mention the tool number three is incentive for startup. Incentive for startup. The tool number four is incentive for R&D, research and development. And the last tool of a taxation is uh, advantage of comparison between debt and equity. That means taxation on debt and equity. I summarize it, don't worry. For the players, is it okay? Players, is it okay? So if you understand the players, the problem is considering these three players, what are the tools the government can use to manage taxation? The first tool we have to manage is taxation on capital gain, okay? 
just to check, taxation on capital gain is relevant for which players? Vehicles and investors. Because the vehicle generates a capital gain and you have a first problem of taxation. Second, the investor at the end of the vehicle take money and you have another problem of taxation on capital gain. Taxation on dividends, why is it relevant? Because sometimes a vehicle can take dividends from the company. That is not enough because the government can use also other taxation tools. The taxation tool number three is incentive for startup. Why is relevant and what are incentives for startup? Why is relevant and what are incentives for startup? Incentives for startup are mechanisms that help companies in startup. That means companies in startups following certain conditions cannot pay taxes. If we use a lot this tool, it's obvious that in that country there will be a lot of investment in venture capital. If we don't have any incentive to start up, it's very difficult that in a country there is venture capital. So the third tool we have to analyze is the tool of incentive for start up. Because this taxation tool has an impact on the private equity market like the fourth tool, which is incentive to research and development. If in a country there are big taxation incentives for the companies or for the investors that spend money to run R&D projects, probably in that country there will be higher volume in venture capital. Okay? Just to give you an example, in Ireland there are impressive volume of venture capital, okay, because Irish people are quite smart and blah, 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 but at the very end of the day, the reason is that in Ireland there are the biggest incentive for startup and research and development in the world. That means, obviously, the size of investment of venture capital is tremendously high. For what reason? Because a lot of companies would like to move to Ireland and to Dublin to create their headquarters or their corporation to run R&D projects. For what reason? Taxation incentive. But if Stefano stay in Dublin because R&D incentive, it's obvious that a lot of private equity investors would like to move to Dublin and to invest in venture capital. If we don't have an incentive like in Italy, unfortunately, it's very hard to run R&D project in Italy. For what reason? Because I spend money, I don't have an incentive. What is the consequence? I don't run R&D project in Italy because it's a nonsense. And if we don't run R&D project in Italy, it's very difficult that in Italy there are investment in seed and startup. Not because we are stupid or because we don't have investors. Because it's a nonsense to do this in Italy. It's better to do that in Dublin. So Italian entrepreneurs move in Dublin and also Italian investors would like to invest, invest in venture capital in Dublin, not in Italy. Because it's better in terms of taxation and incentive. Last, the last tools in terms of taxation is taxation on debt and equity. It's quite important because this is a story which is relevant only for company demanding capital, the incentive to raise money through debt or to raise money through equity, it's obvious, has a strong impact on the demands of private equity in a market. In UK, I repeat, it's obvious that there is a tremendous demand of money coming from private equity because of the tremendous taxation advantage to raise money through equity. If you stay in Italy, where the biggest incentive come from raising money through debt, Yes, you raise money also through equity, but the biggest incentive is on debt. And so the size of the market is not very big because of fiscal incentive. Okay? Is it okay from a logical point of view? This is just a preliminary introduction. Now we have to work in some of the metrics, but I want that you understand what is my logical approach. The logical approach is let's highlight what are the players involved in taxation, 
in order that every time you have to give a look to a specific country, you have to say, okay, we have to study who are the players, vehicles, investors, and companies. Great. But what are the tools we have to analyze? Five tools, taxation on capital gain, taxation on dividend, incentive to start up, incentive to R&D, and taxation on debt and equity. These are the five items you have to analyze. But now we have to do most, and we have to cross the players with the taxation tools, because I want that you understand what are the mechanism uh, the government can use to manage the different tools on the different players. So it's fundamental that you know what are the different mechanisms uh, the governments can use to apply a tool with a specific player. Let's start from the capital gain. From the capital gain, eh, governments in the world generally use three different approaches to tax capital gain in the vehicles. Three different approaches. I would like to mention in order that you start understanding. The first approach is called flat tax. The second approach is called PEX, where PEX stands for participation exemption. And last, tax transparency. Okay? So the three approaches we find in the world, not three approaches that come from the theory, okay? Because from the theory we can create a lot of approaches. But in the world, till now, we have evidence of three approaches governments use to manage taxation on capital gains on vehicle. That means every time you give a look to your country or to a country because you want to understand taxation on capital gain, you have to see, let's try to understand what are the three methods my government or the government of the country we want to study is using for taxation on capital gain. Let's identify what are the three approaches. The approach number one, which is quite common in Europe, is flat tax. Flat tax means the vehicle, the vehicle pays a certain level of taxes, but this level of taxes is lower than the level of taxation in the country. Flat tax means the vehicle pays a certain taxation rate. This is flat. That means no difference considering the different revenues and costs. But this taxation rate is lower than ta the taxation rate in the country. Okay? Example, in Italy, taxation rate is 31.40%. Uh, the taxation for closing fund is 12.5%, flat tax. In Germany, the taxation rate for company is more or less 43%. The flat tax for closing fund is 20%. Okay? So the taxation is flat and is lower than the general level of taxation in the country. This is the first approach we can find. The second approach is participation exemption. Participation exemption is mostly used for investment firms. Participation exemption is mostly used for investment firms. Participation exemption means in a certain country we have a taxation rate. But if our vehicle generates a capital gain following some conditions, the capital gain doesn't pay taxes. It's a more selective tool, you understand, because in flat tax, we simply said, if you manage a vehicle of private equity, don't worry, 
the taxation rate is lower. Tax is more selective because I say the taxation rate for you is the same like in your country. But at some specific condition, you don't pay taxes on capital gain. It's more selective because the government can highlight or specify some conditions, some issues which are relevant for the government and following the tax, I can drive the vehicle to achieve or to get some specific goal which are relevant for me. Example of participation exemption could be, dear vehicle, you don't pay taxes on capital gain, I'm inventing now, you don't pay taxes on capital gain only if you invest in startup. This means, great, I don't pay taxes, but is subject to a specific guideline the government gives to the vehicle. Is more selective than flat tax. The last approach is tax transparency, which is a typical approach of a common law country. Tax transparency means the vehicle doesn't pay taxes. Tax transparency. The vehicle doesn't pay taxes. And this is the story of LP in UK and US, and this is the story of VCT in UK. Tax transparency. You don't pay taxes. Okay? So when we study taxation on capital gain for vehicles, where now you perfectly know the names of the vehicles, in the world we find three different approaches to manage taxation. Flat tax, tax and tax transparency. Uh, our purposes in the next step will be, okay, let's give a look to the example of Italy, US and UK to check in which way these three approaches are used. Okay? Capital gain for investors. In this case, the problem is not the vehicle, but is the investor that invests in a closing fund or the limited partners that invest in LP or a common people that invest in venture capital trust. Okay? It's a story of investors. In this case, not from a theoretical point of view, but exactly from what happened in the market, for the investors, we don't find different tools, but we find always different level of taxation considering two parameters. And the two parameters are legal entities versus private individuals So the first parameter is when you want to fix the taxation rate for an investor in whatever kind of country there is a distinction between legal entities and private individuals. In every country there is a certain taxation for Mr. Stefano Caselli and there is another taxation for Stefano Caselli Limited or Stefano Caselli, I don't know, that invest as a legal entities in a vehicle, okay? In every country. The other parameter is domestic versus non-domestic investors. Domestic versus non-domestic investors. So in every country there is a certain taxation for domestic investors and there is another taxation for foreign investors, okay? Just in case, for example, in the case of Ireland, the taxation for non-domestic, sorry, for forage investor is zero, okay? For what reason? Because in the policy of Ireland, the idea is to say we would like to attract investors coming from outside. In order that if you come and invest in vehicles in Ireland, don't worry, you don't pay taxes on capital gain. If you have another idea, and you want to say, I want that only domestic investors invest, obviously you have to use a 0% for domestic and you have to increase the taxation rate for foreign investors. Okay? But these are the two parameters. So 
when you want to understand the taxation on capital gain for investors, you have to cross together two different variables. Legal entities versus private individual and domestic versus foreign investors. That means you identify four different situations you have to analyze. Also in this case, we will see the story for Italy, US and UK, just examples to apply. Taxation on capital gain obviously is not relevant for company, demanding capital. Taxation on dividends, you are lucky because in whatever kind of country, because taxation on dividends is not so important. What is important in private equity is taxation on capital gain, obviously. In both cases, in every country, we have evidence that the taxation of dividends is exactly the same of taxation on capital gain in the world of private equity. For what reason? Because taxation on dividends is a minor issue in private equity. That's the reason why in whatever kind of country you want to design the framework of taxation of private equity, you say, okay, taxation of dividends is the same like taxation of capital gains. Okay? Okay, guys? For vehicles to take dividends is quite hard or impossible. I repeat it many times, please try to remember it. You have to know why it's quite hard or impossible that a vehicle take dividends. Because if you are a private equity investor and you invest in a company, your commitment, your goal is to have a capital gain and you don't want the company in which you are investing give dividends. Because if the company gives dividends, you are losing value of the company. So when you invest in a company or a private equity, it's quite hard that you want dividends. Second, is possible. Now we have to apply the concepts you study. Is possible that an investor receives dividends from the vehicle in which invest. The cases, guys, are three. Closing fund, investment firm, limited partnership. Immediately, you have to start to apply. In the three cases, it's possible that an investor receives dividends? You have to know. In a limited partnership, you can receive dividends? Absolutely not. Because the limited partners invest in a 10 years limited partnership, for what reason? To wait 10 years and to have the final capital gain. So you cannot. In a closing fund, you can receive dividends? Absolutely not. Because in a closing fund, you have to wait for 10 years and you have capital gain. If in the internal code of activity it's written that you receive money in advance, they are a percentage of the capital gain. No, absolutely. If I give you money in advance, is a percentage of the future capital gain. They are not a dividends. The only case in which you can take dividends is the investment firm because an investment firm is a company which is devoted to invest in private equity and because it's a company, sometimes, if you want, if you agree, the investment firms can give to you dividends. But with the exception of investment firm, private equity for investor is not a story of dividends. It's a story of capital gain or capital gain, percentage of capital gain that I give to you in advance for closing funds. So it's very, very marginal. Incentive for startup and invest incentive for research and development are not relevant for vehicles and investors. They are relevant for company demanding capital because incentive for startup 
an incentive for research and development are fiscal incentives that I give to the company that has to launch the startup and or has to launch a research and development project. In these cases, we find three different methods of incentive which are exactly the same both for startups and research and development. So we find exactly the same incentive. As usual, I give first of all to you the labels and later I give to you the comments. The first incentive is called the markdown approach. This is the first approach, markdown approach. The second approach is the shadow, shadow cost approach. And last is the approach of a tax credit. So if you want to create generate incentive for startups and R&D in the company, you have three different tools. The tool number one, mark down approach. The method number two is a shadow cost approach. And the method number three is a tax credit approach. These are the three methods you can use if you want to generate incentive for startup and or R&D. Let's start from the method number one. The method number one is very simple, is the markdown approach. Markdown approach is more typical for startup. It's very simple because I say, for you that you launch a startup, I apply a tax rate which is lower than the common tax rate in the country. Mark down. You apply to the company a tax rate which is lower than the tax rate of the country. This is a typical approach when you want to create incentive for startup because you say to the company, if you launch a startup, don't worry, for the first three years the taxation rate is not. Uh, 40% is 10%. It's a markdown approach. It's obvious classical approach for startup. Okay? This is the approach number one. It's not selective, it's very simple and typically perfect for startup. Shadow cost. Shadow cost is perfect both for startup and for R&D. What is shadow cost? It's very simple. When you launch a startup and or when you manage R&D investments, the government says to you, you can calculate and you can insert your profit and loss accounts, some costs which don't exist, shadow, cost which don't exist, but I give to you the possibility to insert in the profit and loss account in order that you pay a lower level of taxation. Examples of shadow cost. Let's imagine, Cindy, you launch a project of 1 billion euros of R&D, okay? Obviously, following the rule of your country or the country in which you stay, this project will generate for you costs. Is it okay? Because you probably you will split the investment of one million in through three, four, five pieces. Okay? For example, in Italy, but it's very common, when you launch a, an investment in R&D, you have to divide the investment into five parts and for five years, you can spend the 20% of costs. Okay? But I can follow a shadow cost approach because I want to create for you incentive to invest. I can say, don't worry, the 20% of cost is fine, but I give to you a special bonus. And the special bonus is, in the year number one, you can insert a cost in your profit and loss account, which is equal, for example, to the 30% of the investment. This cost 
doesn't exist because it's a bonus, but you are very happy because you don't pay taxes. You understand? Yes or not, like always. Is it okay? For startup, generally the shadow cost approach is a use calculating again a cost which doesn't exist but linked, for example, to the amount of fixed asset you need for the startup. That means in the year number one, I need a certain investment in fixed asset. It's okay. I give to you a special bonus, and the special bonus is a certain percentage of the fixed asset you can insert in the profit and loss account. This cost, again, doesn't exist, but you are very happy because this cost has an impact in terms of falling down of the taxation of your company. Shadow cost approach. Comparing with markdown approach, shadow cost approach is more selective because in the markdown approach, simply you have a taxation benefit. Great. In the shadow cost approach, you have a benefit which is related to the amount of the investment you did, both for the startup and the R&D. It's more selective because the more you invest, the more you benefit. In markdown approach, doesn't matter your investment. It's the same for everybody. The approach number three is follow me. Quite similar to shadow cost, but is more sophisticated and more selective. More sophisticated and more selective. In this case, the approach is when you invest in a startup and R&D, I would like to give to you a benefit again. In this case, the benefit is not a cost which doesn't exist, but I give to you a tax credit which is calculated again as a percentage of the investment. But to have a tax credit is more useful and sophisticated for a company because a tax credit is a voucher and you, spend, you can spend this voucher when you want. If this year you don't need to have taxation advantage, you have a voucher and you can spend this voucher in 2012. That's great. It's more sophisticated than shadow cost because in shadow cost you can spend the cost only this year. And in some cases for you it's great, but if in this year you don't pay taxes, to have a shadow cost for you is unuseful. To have a tax credit, that means a voucher is better for you. It's more sophisticated because you can use the voucher, the tax credit, when it's more convenient for you. This year, next year, between 10 years, is better for you because you have a credit and you can spend it when you want. However, it's a selective like shadow cost because the tax credit is related to the amount of your investment. So it's more selective like the shadow cost. Okay? If you stay in a very unlucky country, I'm sorry, like Italy, you don't have markdown approach, you don't have shadow cost, and you don't have tax credit. So you want to launch startup, you want to manage R&D, it's your problem. Thank you very much. You don't have incentive. So it's quite stupid if you say, okay, Italian people have to invest in startup and R&D. Italian people invest in startup and R&D in other country because they don't have incentive in Italy, not because they are stupid. But it's the same in every country. Taxation incentives are a very powerful driver because taxation incentive, please remember, has a very strong impact on risk and return. It's the major driver of risk and return. Uh, what we have to do, because now yeah, the time is over, is because it's not easy, we have to give a look to the last tools, which is taxation on debt and equity. And taxation on debt and equity is relevant for company, sorry, it's a disaster, for company demanding capital, just one second, oh, don't worry, it's relevant for company demanding capital, but it's also relevant for the vehicles that can leverage, like limited partnership and investment firms is relevant because 
for a limited partnership, it's important to know if I have to pay taxes on debt or not. So it's quite relevant for this player, but it's also relevant for the players that can leverage. That's it. Uh, we have to stop and we start again next week.